Greetings, everybody. Chaplain Bob Walker here, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Get your King James Bible and turn to 1 Samuel chapter 18. We're looking at the life of Saul the king, but it's tied in with uh, David, the future king. Now remember, uh, Samuel was the prophet who had made Saul, well, under the Lord's orders, had made Saul king. But then Saul, uh, Samuel told Saul that the Lord had departed from him because he was disobedient. The Lord said to kill all the livestock and stuff, and uh, Saul didn't do it. Evidently, the livestock was dedicated to Satan, I guess, or by whatever name they went by back in those days. I don't know. There was a lot of different... I don't know if it's actually Satan himself or just one of the fallen angels uh, picked a name, or maybe it is their name, you know. Uh, Marduk, Mur Murdoch, uh, Molech, uh, a lot of different names. You, it could possibly be, it could actually possibly be their real names. You never know. But uh, different areas had their different gods, I guess you could say, that uh, were in charge so to speak. So here it is. The Lord knows that he's going to give Israel the promised land, the land promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And of course, Satan's devils here on earth are going to oppose that plan. I don't think their plan's going to work, but uh, they're going to try. Just remember, there was a war in heaven, and then there's a war on earth. So Saul's been rejected as king because he was disobedient. David had faced Goliath, killed him, and now he was to be Saul's servant. So let's... Uh, Read 1 Samuel chapter 18. Now remember too that uh, Jonathan, who was the son of Saul, uh, really cared about David too. I mean, Jonathan was a, he was a soldier in his own right, as is was David. So they respected and cared about each other. Uh, you'll probably, if you listen to all the devils out there they'll tell you that Saul uh, I'm sorry that David and Jonathan were a couple of uh, Sodom and the word ites at the end of it and I don't think so no you know in England that was called the sin that shouldn't even be named that's what it was called. It was such an abomination. They didn't even like to say the word. And nowadays we not only embrace it, we, uh, yeah, how far we have fallen. All right, 1 Samuel 18, verse 1. And it came to pass when he, David, when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul, that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Uh, they became very good friends. Verse 2. And Saul took him that day and would let him go no more home to his father's house. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan, the king's son, right? stripped himself of the robe that was upon him and gave it to David and his garments, even to his sword 
and to his bow, and to his girdle. And David went out whithersoever Saul sent him, and behaved himself wisely. And Saul sent him over the men of war, and he was accepted in the sight of all the people, and also in the sight of Saul's servants. Well, you know, here it is the guy, uh, David was the giant killer of Goliath, you know? You'd be happy to have that guy around. And it came to pass as they came, when David was returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, that the women came out of all cities of Israel, singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tabrets, with joy, and when, with instruments of music. And that's what a tabret is. It's a type of uh, musical instrument. And the women answered one another as they played and said, Saul hath slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands. So here it is there ascribing to the king thousands, but to David ten times as much. Verse 8. And Saul was very wroth. He was mad. He was angry. And Saul was very wroth. And the saying displeased him. And he said, They have ascribed unto David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed but thousands. And what can he have more but the kingdom? And Saul I David from that day and forward. So here it is, Saul's jealous of David. And that's not going to be a good thing. Verse 10. And it came to pass on the morrow that the evil spirit from God came upon Saul, and he prophesied in the midst of the house, and David played with his hand as at other times. And there was a javelin in Saul's hand. If you don't know what a javelin is, it's a spear. And Saul cast the javelin, for he said, I will smite David even to the wall with it. And David avoided out of his presence twice. Oh yeah, that's a nice way to repay the guy that killed uh, Goliath, the giant, you know, that saved Israel. You're going to kill him. He helped save your kingdom, and you're going to kill this guy? Really? So not only had God rejected Saul for disobedience, now Saul's uh, trying to kill God's anointed. I don't think Saul is doing too good here. Verse 11. And Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him, and was departed from Saul. Therefore Saul removed him from him and made him his captain over a thousand and went out and came in before the people. And David behaved himself wisely in all his ways and the Lord was with him. Wherefore when Saul saw that he behaved himself very wisely, he was afraid of him. Well, David was a a good guy, and Saul was behaving badly, I guess you could say, right? But all Israel and Judah loved David because he went out and came in before them. And Saul said to David, Behold, my elder daughter, Merab, her will I give thee to wife. So here it is. Saul is offering his oldest daughter, to David, right? Only be thou valiant for me and fight the Lord's battles. For Saul said, Let not mine hand be upon him, but let the hand of the Philistines be upon him. You see, Saul's thinking, Oh yeah, I'll send him to go fight the Philistines and let them kill him. And then I won't be responsible. And David said unto Saul, who am I, and what is my life, or my father's family in Israel, that I should be son-in-law to the king? I mean, 
Really, think about it. How would you like to be son-in-law to the king? Or a daughter-in-law, right? Okay, so Saul promised David his oldest daughter. Verse 19, what did he do? Rid nigs on the promise. But it came to pass at the time when Mirab, Saul's daughter, would have been given to David that she was given under Adriel, the Meholathite, to wife. I know, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. I didn't take Hebrew in Bible college, so... Verse 20. And Michael, or is it Michelle? I think it's Michelle. Michelle. Saul's daughter loved David, and they told Saul, and the thing pleased him. You know, David's probably a handsome young guy, you know, and he's got a reputation, you know, he killed the giant. Saul's daughter probably said, oh, yeah, I like this guy, you know. And Saul said, I will give him her that she may be a snare to him, a trap, and that the hand of the Philistines may be against him. Wherefore Saul said to David, Thou shalt this day be my son-in-law in the one of the twain. Oh, yeah. I Wait a minute. Okay, Saul. I, I've heard this before. You know? David's probably rolling his eyes right about now. And Saul commanded his servants, saying, Commune with David secretly, and say, Behold, the king hath delight in thee, and all his servants love thee. Now therefore be the king's son-in-law. And Saul's servants spake these words in the ears of David, and David said, Seemeth it to you to be a light thing, to be a king's son-in-law? I mean, do you think this is just a tiny little thing to be the son-in-law for the king? Seeing that I am a poor man and lightly esteemed. And the servants of Saul told him, saying, On this manner spake David. And Saul said, Thus shall you say to David, The king desireth not any dowry, but an hundred foreskins of the Philistines to be avenged of the king's enemies. But Saul thought to make David fall by the hand of the Philistines. Yeah, he wanted him to, you know, die in the battle against the Philistines. A hundred foreskins. I I don't think I'd be the one wanting to uh, collect that prize, but uh, yeah. And when his servants told David these words, it pleased David well to be the king's son-in-law, and the days were not expired. I guess there was like a time limit. I don't know. Wherefore, David arose and went, he and his men, and slew of the Philistines 200 men, Okay, so you ask for a hundred, I'm going to give you two hundred. And David brought their foreskins, and they gave him in full tale to the king, that they might be the king's son-in-law. And Saul gave him Mashal, Michelle, Michal, his daughter to wife. And Saul saw and knew that the Lord was with David, and that Mashal, Saul's daughter, loved him. And Saul was yet the more afraid of David, and Saul became David's enemy continually. You know, it's a bad news when you're um, when the Lord's with somebody and you're that person's enemy. Not a good place to be. Then the princes of the Philistines went forth, and it came to pass after they went forth that David beheld himself more wisely than all the servants of Saul, so that his name was much set by. All right, let's read the next chapter. Now listen to this. Uh, and Saul spake to Jonathan his son and to all his servants that they should kill David. Oh, yeah, the guy that uh, saved the kingdom. You're going to kill him, right? Really? Uh, not a very good game plan, if you ask me. But Jonathan, 
Saul's son delighted much in David, and Jonathan told David, saying, Saul my father seeketh to kill thee. Now therefore, I pray thee, take heed to thyself until the morning, and abide in a secret place, and hide thyself. And I will go out and stand beside my father in the field where thou art, and I will commune with my father of thee, and what I see, that will I tell thee. And Jonathan spake good of David unto Saul his father, and said unto him, Let not the king sin against his servant, against David, because he hath not sinned against thee, and because his works have been good to thee word, very good. For he did put his life in his hand, and slew the Philistine, and the Lord wrought a great salvation for all Israel. Thou sawest it, and didst rejoice. Wherefore then wilt thou sin against innocent blood to slay David without a cause? And Saul hearkened unto the voice of Jonathan, and Saul sware, As the Lord liveth, he shall not be slain. Uh... Liar, liar, pants on fire. And Jonathan called David, and Jonathan showed him all these things. And Jonathan brought David to Saul, and he was in his presence as times passed. And there was war again, and David went out and fought with the Philistines and slew them, slew them with a great slaughter, and they fled from him. And the evil spirit from the Lord was upon Saul as he sat in his house with his javelin in his hand. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, David must be looking at Saul the whole time, uh, thinking, wait a minute, is this going to be another repeat? You know? And David played with his hand, and Saul sought to smite David even to the wall with the javelin, but he slipped away out of Saul's presence, and he smote the javelin into the wall, and David fled and escaped that night. Saul also sent messengers unto David's house to watch him and to slay him in the morning. And Mishal, David's wife, told him, saying, If thou save not thy life tonight, tomorrow thou shalt be slain. So Mishal let David down through a window, and he went and fled and escaped. And Mishal took an image and laid it in the bed and put a pillow of goat's hair for his bolster and covered it with a cloth. So, yeah, you know, have you ever done that? You make it look like somebody's sleeping in the bed and it's got the uh, goat's hair and covered it with a, you know, bedspread. And when Saul sent messengers to take David, she said, He is sick. And Saul sent the messengers again to see David, saying, Bring him up to me in the bed, that I may slay him. And when the messengers were coming, behold, there was an image in the bed with a pillow of goat's hair for his bolster. And Saul said unto Mishael, Why hast thou deceived me so, and, went and sent away mine enemy, that he has escaped? And Mishael answered Saul, He said unto me, Let me go. Why should I kill thee? So here it is. She's lying to her father to avoid getting, probably her getting killed too. Saul doesn't, uh, Saul's batting uh, pretty, pretty badly here. He's striking out. That's a baseball term, people, for you ladies. I, I never was much for baseball, but... So David fled and escaped and came to Samuel to Ramah and told him all that Saul had done to him. And he and Samuel went and dwelt in Naoth. And it was told Saul, saying, Behold, David is at Naoth in Ramah. And Saul sent messengers to take David. And when he saw the company of the prophets prophesying and Samuel standing as appointed over them, that the Spirit of God was upon the messengers of Saul, and they also prophesied. And when it was told Saul, he sent other messengers, and they prophesied likewise. And Saul sent messengers again the third time, and they prophesied also. 
So that's what the Spirit of God can do, people. And we're not talking about a fake thing like you see in a lot of TV preachers, you know, speaking gibberish, right? Then went he, Saul, then went he also to Ramah and came to a great well that is in Sichu. And he asked and said, Where is Samuel and David? And one said, Behold, they be at Naoth in Ramah. And he went thither to Naoth in Ramah, and the Spirit of God was upon him also. And he went on and prophesied until he came to Naoth in Ramah. And he stripped off his clothes also and prophesied before Samuel in this manner and lay down naked all that day and all that night. Wherefore, they say, is Saul also among the prophets? So, why did he strip off his clothes? I wonder, I wonder if that has something to do with the following. So, what is the uh, meaning of being naked here? Well, I, the thing I usually try to do is look up a word or an idea or a phrase. First time it appears in the King James, and that usually gives you an idea of the meaning. What about in Genesis chapter 3, when Adam and Eve were uh, partook of the tree of knowledge of good and evil? Verse 7, And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Let's skip to verse 10. And he, Adam, said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. They're hiding from God their nakedness. And he, God, said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree? Whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? Uh, well, yeah, that's, that. we, we did it this time, didn't we, Lord? Oh, yeah. All right, what about nakedness? Well, let's take a look at Revelation chapter 3. We started at the beginning of the Bible, Genesis chapter 3, with nakedness. Now we're going to go to the last book of the Bible, Revelation, and look at chapter 3. So we're going from Genesis 3 to Revelation 3. Verse 14. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write. Now Laodicea, uh, Lord didn't have any good things to say about them. These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. You know, think about it. In wintertime, what do you want to drink? Hot coffee? Hot tea? Uh, when it's summer, what do you want to drink? Iced coffee? Iced tea? What good is lukewarm? Uh, you know, verse 16. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. I'm going to spit you out. Verse 17. Because thou sayest, I am rich. I attend Benny Hinn's church and I got a, you know, Mercedes Benz and, oh, wait. Oh, no, never mind. That's the Bob translation. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. Oh, yeah, I got my house on the beach. I got a trophy wife, a hot-looking babe on the side. I got a Mercedes. You know, 
I got it all. The Lord's been blessing me. Oh, really? Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Now, obviously, they got clothing on. So what are they naked? Spiritually, they're naked. They have no covering for their sin. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment What's a raiment? Clothing. It's a, like a robe, right? And white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thy eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. There be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So when they're talking about nakedness, Saul was physically naked but spiritually he was naked too he had no covering for his sin all right jesus speaking in john chapter 15 verse 20 remember the word that i said unto you the servant is not greater than his lord well duh you know these uh people in the west west that think that they're not going to have to suffer for christ they think they're better than the Lord. The Lord suffered and died for us, and they think they're better than him. Oh, God would never make us suffer for our faith. Oh, no. God's not a wife beater. Well, God the Father let his son suffer, but you don't think you'll have to suffer? Really? Uh, I don't know what Bible they read. They claim they read the King James, but... I don't know. Well, maybe maybe they read the King James, but their pastor reads the uh, Satanic Bible by the Church of Satan. I don't know. The servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will persecute. They will also persecute you. If they have kept my, my saying, well, Jesus warned, if they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. In other words, they will try to use your words against you to get you in trouble. Uh, that's a big reason why any good defense attorney will tell you that if the police arrest you, don't talk to them. Because even if you make an honest mistake, uh, for example, you say, oh yeah, I went to... Uh, the restaurant on a Thursday but it was actually a Wednesday and you made an honest mistake they'll uh, and they can prove that you told them something that was incorrect even though you weren't trying to lie to them they'll use that against you remember anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law everything you say will be used against you and Everything you say will be used against you, but nothing you say will help you. So there is absolutely zero reason to talk to the police. You know, that's why they say, ask, uh, say, I'll be happy to answer questions, with, uh, but first I wish to co consult with legal counsel. I wish to con consult with a lawyer, an attorney. But that's basically what they're saying. They're going to use your words against you. Verse 21. 
But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. They don't know Jesus, and they don't know God the Father who sent Jesus. If I had not come and spaken unto them, they had not had sin. But now they have no cloak for their sin. What's a cloak? It's a piece of clothing. They have no clothing for their sin. Verse 23, He that hateth me hateth my father also. I wish John Hagee's church would uh, read this. Uh, you know John Hagee's never going to read it. Those that hate Jesus hate God the Father also. In Revelation 1 and verse 5, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Now remember something. Christ uh, of the physical realm came from the line of David the king. Oh yeah. Saul was trying to kill the Messiah generations before he was even born. Think about that. Saul wanted to kill David. Yeah. Not a not a very good uh, thing, right? All right, uh, Revelation 7 and verse 12. Saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? White robes? You know, what are these which are arrayed or dressed? What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? You know, who are these dressed in the white robes and where do they come from? Verse 14. And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. Oh, you know. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. See, the blood of the Lamb wash the robes that they cover their sins with, the white robes. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple, and he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. So Paul, Saul was naked physically and spiritually. All right, let's go. You know, Saul had his son, Jonathan, who was, you know, David's good friend. And he knew, Jonathan, the, the king's own son, knew that his dad was in the wrong. So let's read. 1 Samuel chapter 20, verse 1. And David from fled from Naoth to in Ramah and came and said before Jonathan, What have I done? What is mine iniquity? You know, what have I done to Saul? And what is my sin before thy father that he seeks seeketh my life? You know, what did I do? Why, you know, why does he want to kill me? 